Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on getting a handle on contract closeout. I'm Susan Moser, I'll be one of your speakers today. This webinar is brought to you by Cherry Beckert. We often put on webinars of topics of interest to our government contract clients and friends. Today's speakers are myself. Um, I'm a partner with Cherry Beckert. I started the firm's government contractor practice about 20 years ago. With me is Javier Diaz. He's a manager in our government contracts practice. Javier started his career with DCA as an auditor. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> and he's been a uh, consultant uh, helping contractors in a variety of different areas for a number of years now. I'll go over our uh, agenda in just a minute. I will say um, this presentation today, we do have a fair amount of information to cover in a short period of time, about an hour. A copy of today's uh, slides will be available after the presentation. Um, so you will get an email with a copy of the slides a couple days after, um, after the webinar today. In addition, during the webinar, if you do have questions, we would encourage you to ask them. You can send in questions on the chat line. Um, if we have time at the end of our presentation, we will try to answer uh, some of the questions. If we have questions that we are not able to answer during the presentation, um, do not worry. We will definitely follow up with you and answer your question um, directly. Um, Oftentimes we get questions that are good questions that are asked by the group, and so if there is something that comes up after the webinar that's, that we think is relevant and of interest to others, um, we will put something on our blog uh, site. So for those of you that may not be familiar, um, Cherry Becker, we do have an active website. With, we put out a lot of content for government contractors, uh, including copies of our past webinars. But also, uh, we update uh, the blog on almost a daily basis, it seems like, for uh, issues that come up that would be of interest and relevant to, to government contractors. So uh, with that, let me just uh, go through our agenda today. Um, uh, myself and Javier will be um, taking turns talking about different topics. We'll sort of uh, go back and forth um, uh, as we go throughout the presentation. So. What we want to cover is what is a contract closeout, um, why we're supposed to perform them. We'll go through a little bit of the mechanics of the actual contract closeout process. Uh, final payment, which is, of course, um, important. We'll also talk about some common issues and some best practices. Um, the last couple of slides contain some references and some samples. Um, we will not spend any time on that today, but when you do get the email link with the slides, um, you will have that information um, for future future reference. So with that, uh, let's get started with what is the con what is a contract closeout. So contract closeouts are uh, prescribed in the FAR uh, in, in section 4.8, and they really are in support of the maintenance and disposition of contracts and contract files. It is the final step uh, in the contract uh, process. And it is the um, completion and settlement of all of the costs on the con contract, including resolution of any open items. So really what we're talking about today is an administrative process. And um, I'll be the first to say it's not the most exciting process, um, and it's probably not a process that a lot of contractors pay as much attention um, or put as much emphasis around. Hopefully, after we're finished the, the webinar today, um, you'll have a little better understanding of the importance of the contract closeout process and um, maybe some ideas about how to incorporate um, contract closeout administrative processes throughout your everyday um, business practices. So with that, let's start with uh, what triggers the contract to be closed. Well, the first thing that triggers the contract to be uh, closed out is the physical completion of the contract. So uh, whether you're providing supplies or services, um, there is an end to the physical uh, delivery of the product or the service. Um, the physical completion occurs um, 
you know, if you're providing services, there is a period of performance. Once that period of performance ends, if there is no final um, extension on the contract, the period of performance isn't uh, extended, um, there is an end of the contract. Um, for uh, supplies, there's typically a receiving report there is, or an agency-specific um, form that signifies that the government has accepted those um, that uh, supply or service. Um, so with that, Javier is going to talk a little bit about some of the different people and parties that are involved in the contract closeout process. So you guys may be uh, already familiar with uh, some of these individuals and entities. Um, I'm just going to uh, go through these pretty quickly to for the, those individuals that um, probably want a little bit more details of, as to the responsibilities for each of these roles. Um, I'll be going over the ACO, the Contracting Officer, uh, Contract Specialist, COTAR, DCAA, and then in some people's opinion, the most important part, the contractor. Um, with the ACO, uh, they normally uh, have a contract a specialist that assists them. Their main uh, responsibilities are to preserve the contract records and to work with DCAA to get uh, a final and direct rate for each of the, the contractors. Um, as far as for the closeout items or actions, um, some of their responsibilities are patent clearances and uh, bilateral modifications to definitize uh, incentive contracts. So I'm kind of jumping um, through these a little quickly only because we're going to be going into more detail on these in, uh, uh, in slides in the future. Um, so the next uh, uh, role would be the COTAR, or the Contracting Officer's Technical Re Representative. Uh, this person is the individual with the technical expertise to be able to assist the contracting officer in making decisions. Um, the, one of the most important ones are whether or not the deliverable was uh, uh, is accepted and, and is in line with what was uh, needed or required by the contract. So um, they will assist the uh, the uh, ACO by providing the uh, evidence of, of physical completion, and also they'll monitor and report on technical performance of that contract. Uh, the next entity is. Uh, DCAA. Um, these are the guys that everybody loves having in their office. Um, their uh, main responsibilities are uh, to audit and review uh, supporting documents for each of the contractors in respect with respect to the uh, um, annual incurred cost submission. Um, that's going to be the main impact on uh, contract closeouts. Uh, trying to get those final rates so that uh, uh, for all of the years the the contract has been performed on, and um, and making sure that the contractor abides by the uh, cost accounting standards and FAR is applicable. And so, just a couple things to add. So we we're talking about DCAA. We will um, uh, during the presentation we will address uh, contract closeout um, requirements. Uh, which are obviously outlined in the FAR, but each individual agency may have some different practices. So um, DCA is obviously um, the most uh, known uh, audit agency, but there are other agencies that use um, other uh, auditors, and so um, that we're sort of saying that is a little bit of a generic, um, generic term. And then the, the responsibilities of the contractor. Um, Main responsibilities are to preserve contract records. This will assist in the audit process. So all uh, costs incurred um, should have a supporting document. And, and when DCAA is reviewing your incurred cost submission, you'd be they'd be requesting those documents to ensure that the uh, the costs are allowable, uh, allowable, allocable, and reasonable. Um, you're also responsible to dispose of the government furnished equipment and classified documents and um, provide any information on patents and royalties to the ACO and or COTAR. Um, as far as for uh, contract closeouts, you, you should also or you're required to 
sign and submit a release of claims to the government. So knowing all the individuals that are involved, you're probably asking yourself why you should perform a contract closeout. I'll leave that to Susan. Okay. Uh, here comes the really exciting part of this presentation. Um, why you're required to perform it is because you are contractually obligated to perform this, uh, this function. And sometimes I think companies um, forget that, or they don't forget it, but they just maybe don't put as much of an emphasis um, on that. So, so let's just talk about um, a, a couple of points on that. So um, the, um, as we mentioned, the uh, closing the, the contract files is mandated within the FAR. And actually, there are time standards um, for when contracts and different contract types um, should be closed out. Um, obviously, you have to establish the final price and make uh, the government has to make um, final payment. As we talked about before, that closeout process starts when the contract is physically complete. Um, there are instances where contracts cannot be closed out. Um, any contract that's in litigation is under appeal or uh, in the case of a termination, if the termination actions are not complete, you cannot start the closeout process. So we want to talk a little bit about some, some best practices. And um, as I mentioned up front, ideally it's best to not wait until the contract is physically complete to start out, start the closeout process. Um, each year, if you devote a little bit of time to doing some steps in the closeout process, um, we're going to make a case that you'll be uh, well served by doing that, and I think you can save some time and, and money. Um, so every contract does not necessarily have, there are obviously some standard practices and requirements for contract closeouts, but each solicitation and RFP may have some different requirements. Um, so it's important that you understand that and that you know uh, what your requirements and obligations are for collecting and retaining documents. And, and I will say, uh, maintaining good records uh, from the beginning of the contract and throughout is really the key to making this an easy process, easier process. I think this is a lot easier for companies than it used to be because so many, uh, so many of you keep your uh, records electronically. Um, we often get involved with helping companies do contract closeouts when they are, you know, massively behind or there's been uh, acquisitions or change in personnel and frankly the hardest part a lot of times is finding the documents. Um, so one of the first steps in the process is maintaining a good filing system and so that sounds like very basic information but having a good filing system whether that is a paper or electronic you know knowing how you keep your folders and and having other people within your organization know how those things are organized um, is a really important step of the process that should start before your contract is physically complete um, one of the things that we always want to remind everyone is in all likelihood the person that going to be responsible for closing out the contract is probably not the same person who was there when you were performing the contract. And so planning ahead, developing schedules, coming up with a process is really the key to making this um, less of an administrative burden. Um, you want to use a checklist. So as we uh, continue in our webinar, we'll talk about some of the different Javier um, cover just in a summary uh, some of the, the requirements for different reports, government furnished equipment. Um, so you want to have a checklist uh, that you can check off as you've completed or you've you know, accumulated different documents that are required in the, in the closeout process. Um, another best practice is implement a training program to teach people in your organization um, how to close out contracts. Um, a lot of companies, uh, again, particularly if they haven't dealt with it a lot, uh, will ask us and we will put on a training class and, and teach people how to do it and efficient ways to do it. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I, I'm sure if, if, uh, if I can hear the people that are listening today, uh, include money in the budget for closeout activities. Um, I always say that now 
how likely people are to take me up on that, um, but um, there is an administrative cost of doing business, obviously, with the federal government, and the closeout is a required process, and so um, you should anticipate that there is some cost associated with doing that. Um, so a couple um, steps to sort of simplify the closeout process. Um, so prepare and distribute the DD-250s. So those are your material and receiving reports. So again, have a process where you, know, where you keep them, how they're organized. Um, prepare and distribute invoices and vouchers properly. So again, a lot of systems now, you can keep the uh, invoice records pretty easily. Um, tracking the payments and having a good history. Sometimes, you know, you send an invoice out, but the government doesn't pay it or they short pay it. Um, but having that information all readily available um, when you start the contract closeout process is going to make things run much smoother. Um, immediately report any overpayments. So one of the things that is a source of frustration for lots of contractors is you accidentally get overpaid by the government, not through any fault of your own, and then trying to actually return that money is a very difficult process. Um, if you, uh, you certainly want to report it immediately, ask for the proper procedures, um, and you want to keep track of that. Another thing that's really important for contract closeouts is um, tracking the limitation of funds, um, being able to um, understand your contract ceilings, um, fixed price ceilings, um, and keeping having that information, um, you know, available to you. Um, if you have patents, obviously you've got to um, adhere to the uh, to the terms of uh, patent requirements. Um, Javier talked about if you do have cost contracts, you do have to submit your incurred cost submission within six months of your year end. Um, when you have, and this is a key point, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but um, when you get final indirect rates, uh, and I'm really talking about a cost contract here, you are required to prepare final vouchers within four months, 120 days of receiving that final indirect rate. And I would say most companies have a really hard time of adhering to this, but that really is the, uh, the requirement. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, reviewing contracts to see if you may have some contracts that qualify for a quick closeout. And, and that's an area we'll talk about because um, it's an area that companies don't take as much advantage of as they, as they should. So now let's talk about the how of the process. Okay. Um, I mentioned time standards. So the FAR actually outlines um, some time standards for when contracts should be closed out based on type. So uh, again, if you think about certain contracts, um, the closeout process is pretty simple. There's not a lot of back and forth. There's not a lot of final invoicing. And so uh, under simplified acquisition, um, the closeout process should happen as soon as you have evidence of property and final payments received. Fixed price, again, a much simpler process should be closed out within six months of physical completion. Um, files for contracts requiring settlement of indirect costs. Um, the FAR references a time standard of 36 months uh, after the contracting officer receives physical completion. This can obviously vary a lot depending on where you your organization stands in the process of receiving final and direct rates. So you don't, this doesn't always um, happen, um, shocker there. But, um, and then really for files for all, con all other contracts within 20 months of the date that the contracting officer says that they are physically complete. So again, that's, a, that's probably more of a guide than, than it is reality, but, um, but that is what is called out for in the, in the FAR. Um, so again, this is just a uh, table that shows you um, what the time frame, what the time frames um, are. So now I'll pass things back to Javier to talk about a little bit more about some of the procedures. So the contract closeout procedures are listed in FAR 4.804-5. Here you'll find the list of 15 items which need to be completed for a contract closeout. Um, 
these 15 items are listed over the next two slides. So some of these items are pretty much uh, um, ensuring disposition of classified material is, uh, is completed, um, making sure that uh, you submit and, and clear the, a patent report if needed, um, that uh, the royalty report is submitted and cleared also. You, you should ensure that the, uh, there's no outstanding value engineering change proposals, uh, property clearances received, plant clearances uh, report is received, that all interim or disallowed costs as a result of the uh, DCAA audits are settled, uh, price revision is completed, taking into consideration any unallowable costs identified by DCAA. Um, Subcontracts should be settled uh, by the prime contractor if there are any outstanding uh, invoices um, in order to be eligible for a closeout, those need to be paid to your subs. Um, prior year indirect cost rates are settled. This goes back into the uh, incurred cost audits by, uh, performed by DCAA and taken into consideration by your ACO. Your termination docket is completed. This is uh, including uh, any claims or uh, adjustments such as a request for equitable adjustments or any outstanding proposals. Um, the contract audit is completed. This it goes back to the incurred cost audits and finalizing the indirect rates for each of the years in which the uh, contract was performed. Um, the contractor's closing statement uh, is completed. This is pretty much a, a release of claims uh, provided from the uh, contractor to the government. Um, it should be signed by a, uh, an officer at the company and printed on company letterhead. Um, the contractor's final invoice and voucher should, uh, has been submitted. Um, we'll go into uh, further details in, later on in the slides as to the difference between the, your interim vouchers and your final voucher, uh, it, uh, things you would have to do differently to, in order to uh, help fill it out. Yeah, we're going to spend a couple minutes quickly on um, uh, specifics for different types of contracts. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is um, what we see happen a lot. So if you are a subcontractor uh, to a prime, um, what we see happen a lot is the contract is physically complete. So say the period of performance ends March 31st this year. Um, and we see a lot of times the prime contractor will quickly send a notification to the subcontractor that um, the, uh, the um, contract is complete and they'd like to deobligate and you know close out the contract. And um, oftentimes a lot of subcontractors are too quick to sign that and um, before they've had a chance to realize that they may have, if, it's, if their subcontract is a cost type contract um, or if there's some trailing expenses, um, and they basically relinquish their opportunity to submit final uh, uh, costs um, because there's not funding. So um, I just thought of that because we see that happen all the time that don't be so quick uh, when you're, just because your prime contractor asks you and says so they want to deobligate funds and move some things around. And this actually also happens from, uh, from agencies, too. At the end of the year, they want to use the money for something else, and they'll say, you know, the contract's complete. You've got $100,000 left on the contract. Um, we'd like to deobligate that and use it for something else. And um, once that's gone, it makes uh, recovering additional funds um, very uh, difficult. I just wanted to mention that. So now I'll be touching on uh, the closeout procedures by contract types. Um, the first one would be uh, a fixed price contract. So the uh, ACO verifies the completion of all deliverables and uh, payment and other uh, administrative actions. Um, one thing to remember about these firm fixed uh, price contracts is that um, 
one of the steps in the closeout procedures is that, to determine whether or not there are excess funds, and those are the funds that Susan was just mentioning that would uh, the, the government would like to deobligate. For uh, firm fixed price contracts, for the most part, there shouldn't be any uh, excess funds. Uh, the contractor is able to uh, invoice up to the total amount of the uh, contract value. The only thing you would have to keep in mind is if, uh, the, if one of those, if you have one of those hybrid firm fixed price contracts that has a cost type CLIN, that CLIN may have excess funds in it. So um, they would have to verify that. For your uh, cost reimbursable contract, um, you need to have final indirect rates uh, for all the years the contract was performed in. Um, I know we keep touching on that, and it's one of the most important things in the uh, contract closeout pr uh, process. And um, it's also, given that DCAA has a huge backlog, one of those items that can take years for you to be able to, to complete. And no fault of the contract, there's just DCAA's backlog. Um, the contractor must also submit a completion voucher, and the ACO assesses whether the costs are allowable and allocable through the help of a DCAA's audit. Um, also, for cost type contracts, uh, you have to have the determination of the final indirect rates. Um, and just as Susan said, do not prematurely deobligate excess funds. Um, it'll be very an uphill battle to be able to get those funds back once they're deobligated. Um, and on this next slide, we have an example of the release of claims that uh, um, I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So um, with that, I'll leave it with Susan for uh, the closeout of the time and material right there. Contract. So the biggest uh, administrative burden from a closeout standpoint comes in with uh, with your cost contracts because you're obviously uh, sending out final uh, you're settling uh, you know potentially multiple years um, so there's definitely more time and, and paperwork involved in the closeout of, of uh, cost type contracts um, for T and M labor hour um, final indirect rate determination is not required. Um, if you do have a situation where you had uh, materials and there is a uh, you do have a um, a floating rate on your just say your G and A applied to materials, then uh, obviously you can have that situation where uh, you are waiting on the final rate. Seems like more often now we see um, companies that have negotiated uh, a fixed. Uh, g and a rate that's not subject to uh, your final um, indirect uh, indirect rate uh, based on your incurred cost emission um, uh, sometimes there is a five percent hourly uh, payment that is due that is withheld um, during the contract and is uh, paid at the end once the um, the release of claims is made um, so that's pretty common on a t and m contract and um, the question that gets asked a lot is, um, you know, should contractors wait? So typical, you know, you have a delivery order type contract. Um, do you close out the tasks as you complete them? Uh, you can close out the tasks as you complete them, um, but you generally are submitting a release of claims for the whole contract. So uh, I know a lot of questions come up uh, as it relates to that. Um, as it relates to closing out um, BPAs, um, basically each uh, task or call on a BPA is handled uh, separately for closeout purposes. Um, typically, BPAs might have a number of different um, orders. It could have fixed price, could have cost reimbursable, and so all of those um, typically need to be closed out on an individual um, basis. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking about quick closeout. Um, because this is a term that a lot of people may be familiar with, but they don't really know what the process is or how it uh, how it actually works. Um, quick closeouts uh, are described in for, uh, Part 42708 of the FAR. 
um, it basically is a process that allows the contracting officer, and, and that's really the operative word, on an individual contract, it is the contracting officer that makes a determination of whether a contract is eligible for uh, quick closeout. There are certain requirements that must be met, which are on the screen. Um, in order to do the quick closeout process, uh, basically the contract has to be physically complete. The amount of unsettled direct and indirect costs to be allocated to the contract must be uh, not exceed the lesser of a million dollars or 10% of the total, total contract value. That can be a pretty large contract um, that is, you know, that we're talking about the unsettled part. Um, the contracting officer is supposed to record, perform a risk, risk assessment, determine if contract quick closeout procedure is required, and um, and yet have an understanding of what the uh, reasonable estimate of what the allocable dollars are. Um, so a quick closeout, basically what happens is instead of waiting until, say you've got a five-year contract, the last year of the contract is 2000, just say for this example, 2017, um, you have only gotten final rates through 2015, and for a variety of reasons, you want to settle this contract and, and be done. You don't want to wait till you have final years. In the quick closeout process, you and the contracting officer negotiate, it really is a negotiation, on you agree on a single indirect, single indirect rates for the life of the contract. So say you were, you might have different provisional rates for each year. Typically, your actual rates are going to fluctuate. But you agree with the contracting officer on final indirect rates that are applied to to all years of the contract. So um, it only is binding on this contract. It doesn't have any impact whatsoever on other contracts. Um, but it does allow you to um, settle things up and, and basically be done with your um, administrative process. Um, there also could be some strategy as far as looking at when it makes sense to do a quick closeout or not. Um, a lot of times the contracting officer, in, before they agree on a uh, quick closeout, they want to see what your history is of, of your um, actual rates. Um, but more and more companies should really look at doing this. A lot of times the contracting officer may not be familiar with this process. So, the contracting officer has to approve, so one of the things that we encourage is that you bring this um, up to your, your contracting officer or ACO, suggest uh, if you have contracts that you want to do this, um, uh, that this is, would, would make sense. It, it makes sense in a lot of ways for the government, too, um, and we just don't see it used as much as we, as much as we can. Um, so uh, as far as the uh, final payment and the uh, completion document, let's talk about what actually that final, that final invoice and payment looks like. So um, when you are submitting your final uh, vouchers, you want to make sure it says that it is the final. Um, the uh, voucher numbers usually um, uh, need to be marked final. Um, it only the final payment will only incur after all of the other closeout actions are complete. So all those things that Javier talked about, uh, you know, patent reports, royalties, uh, government furnished uh, equipment, et cetera, must be done and taken care of before this, this final step in the process. Um, the, um, the actual uh, completion statement for the contract file, the, uh, the FAR, uh, Point, uh, section 4.804 actually does specify the things that must be included or shall be included on your uh, your final completion voucher. I don't think any of these are uh, that uh, significant. They're all things that you're probably used to putting on invoices um, uh, already. So the, the main differences between your regular interim vouchers and your completion vouchers or your final vouchers are listed on this slide. Um, just a quick note, uh, everybody should read their contracts for their specific closeout instructions, especially if the agency you have a contract with isn't DOD. But uh, the main differences for the SF-1034 are to uh, insert a Z after the voucher um, serial number. 
And in the articles and services box, you can um, write cost reimbursable completion voucher and check the final uh, payment box. And for the approved, just insert a, a final payment. And you can leave the buy and title box blank. For the uh, SF 1035, um, you want to include your final indirect rates by year, the contractor's claim and reconciliation statement, and uh, list the major cost elements and total them by year. Um, along with the, the voucher, you also want to uh, um, in provide uh, the contractor's release of claims letter and the contractor's assignment of refunds, rebates, and credits. So one thing um, I just wanted to mention as far as the um, the contractor's cumulative claim and reconciliation uh, schedule. So that's really the the culmination of all of the um, actual direct costs and indirect costs that you're claiming versus what you build. And um, for those of you that are familiar with the incurred cost submission um, schedule I, the allowable cumulative allowable. Uh, cost worksheet, um, that is really supposed to, uh, should ideally mirror what ends up on your uh, on your final invoice. Um, that's just going to show the cost, it's not going to show the, the fee information. Um, but one of the things that, uh, again, on incurred cost emissions, we, a lot of times companies don't uh, put as much sort of um, emphasis on making sure it's, it's accurate, is that that Schedule I is correct. Um, when you submit your incurred cost submission, you're claiming certain rates. If when you get your audit results, those rates change because of question cost or, or whatever, um, it's, it's a good idea for you to go in and update that uh, that Schedule I for what the final rates are, and then accumulate those um, worksheets and the Schedule H's of your incurred cost submission because that really should be the basis of um, this uh, this final uh, completion voucher and that information. And that's really the key to kind of having a, a process for, for doing these. Now I'll discuss some frequent issues and additional guidance. So frequent issues uh, when closing out contracts fall on both sides of the field um, with the government and contractors both having uh, um, some uh, issues in getting these contracts closed out. As far as for the government, uh, the two main issues are the lack of government resources and the delayed negotiations of indirect rates. With uh, the negotiation of indirect rates, this falls on the backlog that DCAA currently has with uh, uh, closing out their incurred cost audit. Um, I've seen some uh, open years uh, or uh, incurred cost submissions that have not been finalized dating uh, five to six years back. So their, their backlog is, is pretty big. As far as for the contractor, um, some contractors may have uh, um, a delay in submitting their final cost voucher. Or um, uh, also, the, the prime contractor can be awaiting some information from the subcontractors. And uh, going back to what uh, Susan said earlier in the presentation, keeping your records and your supporting documents in line is very important because um, when you get to this point, uh, uh, an issue that may come up is you're just missing some of the documentation and, and you're having reconciling issues with uh, um, trying to reconcile to your incurred cost issue. And One thing I, I might want to just add, um, so we work with a lot of small businesses that um, have prime contracts and they have large businesses as their subcontractors. And if the um, if the subcontractor's uh, contract is a cost type contract, we often see situations where the the prime contractor, the small business, is ready to close out the contracts. They've gotten their final indirect rates, um, but they are delayed by the prime contractor has not gotten final rates. And so sometimes that does cause the delays. Um, so even if the prime wants to close it out, if they have subs that have uh, cost reimbursable contracts, um, that can, can create a delay as, as well. 
So um, on the next slide, you'll see we've referenced the uh, DCMA's contract closeout guidebook. Now, this is a very good uh, tool to use for guidance. Um, the objective of the guidebook is to provide best practices to close contracts efficiently. And it'll even give you uh, um, guidance to address solutions for uh, problem closures. So on the next slide, you'll see um, that uh, uh, guidebook is, is pretty much split up between these eight tasks. And, um, and DCMA would follow these, uh, these tasks to, to figure out which is the best way to um, close out the contract. So if you're, you know, again, looking to educate yourself on uh, uh, how to go about doing this, um, there is some, some good guidance. And again, the, the process hasn't really, the, you know, the regulations and the requirements haven't changed in a long time. So, um, so if you have, once you have a process um, in place, um, you can, you know, continue that for a number of years, and so some of the uh, some of the guidance that's out there is a little dated, but it really it really hasn't uh, hasn't changed. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about grant closeouts because they are different, and um, with with government contracts, whether it's with a DoD agency or a civilian agency, um, the process is essentially the same. Um, the things that we talked about, maybe you're not dealing with DCAA, maybe if you're dealing with um, USAID, you're dealing with a, you know, USAID IG's office or some other uh, civilian agency, uh, you know, audit agency as far as finalizing uh, rates. Um, but the process, the forms, the release of claims, all of those types of things are, are the same from, from uh, basically one federal agency to another. Um, a number of companies also have grants, and whether this is a not-for-profit or we work with um, a number of, age, of uh, companies or organizations that have both contracts and grants. Grants are definitely a little bit different, um, and I'm going to go through this information uh, really pretty quickly because we're running short on time, and I realize it doesn't apply to, uh, to a lot of the audience, but I think it is important at least for you to have a basic understanding um, that um, the grant closeout process um, can be a little bit differently different than the contract closeout uh, process. So, so overall, the objective is to ensure that final reports are submitted and reviewed, allowable costs are determined, and amounts due to federal agencies or recipients are determined, and payment arrangements are made. Um, uh, DCMA does handle administrative uh, closeout of defense contracts. Um, however, the Office of Naval, Naval Research, ONR, does handle closeout of grants for all DOD as well as NASA. And so that's a little confusing uh, for organizations because you could have a DOD grant from something other than ONR, uh, but that is the agency that is responsible for, um, for uh, grant closeout for, for DOD. So throughout the uh, throughout the grant crop, uh, process, um, the closeout of grants and cooperative agreements um, is different, as I mentioned, than the closeout of uh, of contracts. The biggest issue is that the requirements of the grants and cooperative um, agreements can vary greatly from one grant document to another. So. Um, the, the big takeaway here is it's really important for you to read the terms and conditions for each grant or cooperative agreement because it's definitely not a one size um, fits all. They can they can definitely uh, vary by uh, vary from from one agency or organization to to the next. Um, Basically, the agencies have the same types of uh, requirements for closing out contracts as are called out in, uh, in Section 4 of the FAR. So let's talk about the contractor's responsibility. So uh, if you have a grant, the contractor's responsibility, again, somewhat similar to, um, to uh, contract, you are responsible for reconciling the financial expenditures to the grant to preparing all final reports, which there are, are is typically a final financial report, there may be quarterly financial reports, progress reports. Um, again, those can, can vary from 
one um, from one uh, grant document to the next. Um, so when does this start? So uh, similar to contract closeouts, grant uh, grant closeout responsibilities begin once the award is physically complete. That's when the clock starts ticking. Uh, final deliverables um, would be identified uh, within the terms and conditions and um, the grant typically does also trigger, has a requirement for a release of final payment. So it's similar to that uh, release of final, final claims. Um, uh, the, the blocks here, um, again, similar to the contract closeout, um, you have a lot of the similar types of requirements. Um, if there's classified material, patents, royalties, um, so Typically, if you're going to use a sort of a checklist type approach, um, your document is going to uh, to look similar. Um, but again, you want to make sure you look at the individual grant because there are some uh, some differences on that. As far as the um, the time frames, um, basically. Uh, Grants should actually be closed out, and typically do get closed out um, quicker than a lot of contracts. Um, they should be closed out within 60 or 90 days after ex uh, expiration of the grant period of performance or 90 days of expiration of the grant document. Um, again, there could be exceptions to that as far as um, uh, reconciliation um, issues and, um, and that type of uh, that type of thing. Okay, so uh, going along as far as the grant closeout, um, similar to contract closeout, um, there is, um, you can use some of the typical forms that you use for uh, contract closeouts, um, indicating final acceptance, um, and DD-250s as far as material and inspection reports. Um, the uh, if you have, if there are uh, security requirements on your grant, again, it would follow pretty much the same as um, as a contract um, as far as the disposition of classified materials um, and all that. So again, that's all going to be pretty similar to, um, to a contract um, as it relates to a grant. Uh, same with patents. Um, we've got some of the forms, specific forms that are listed um, if you do have patents uh, involved in uh, in your uh, in your in your grant um, you'll want to make sure that you handle those uh, correctly um, same with property so one of the things that uh, is a common problem um, is if you have a contract whether this is a contract or a grant and you receive either government furnished equipment or government furnished material um, and so uh, as part of the, your contract closeout, you're required to obviously dispose of that material or turn it back over to the government or whatever the whatever is called for. And oftentimes we find where the government actually doesn't want that, in, they, they don't want that back. Um, and so situation happens all the time where the government just says, oh yeah, you deal with it, we don't want to deal with it. Um, even though everybody understands that really the government doesn't want that back, um, it's important for you as the contractor or the grant holder to make sure that you are following the requirements for um, that are spelled out in your contract and the related clauses. So um, don't um, just uh, distinguish your responsibility for the, the final property closeout um, when the government says they don't want it um, because you can find yourself, you know, several years later running into problems where uh, if you didn't do the, the correct uh, final accounting for, for the disposition. So um, I would just say, you know, an area to, to pay attention to. Um, as far as the, uh, the final uh, closeout of the grant, again, somewhat similar process um, if it's uh, related to a DOD, um, the O&R grants officer will conduct a final review. Um, they will follow, uh, you know, desk review. They can do a full audit. Uh, they will rely on the uniform uh, guidance, and the grant officer will ultimately um, make a decision on disallowance or acceptance of uh, final cost. 
uh, one thing you need to pay attention to is um, uh, any slowdown uh, clauses that are required for your subcontractors and subrecipient uh, grantees. So big emphasis on um, uh, the grant uh, holder being responsible for um, uh, monitoring your subrecipient. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to that in your in your closeout plot process um, as well. Um, a final item uh, that we want to, a couple uh, final items we want to call to your attention as we sort of wrap this up um, is your records retention. So um, you are, uh, as it relates to a grant, you are responsible for retaining your records for three years from the de final date of the submission of the financial report. Um, for your um, uh, contracts, it is three years after final payment of, uh, on the contract. And so uh, you want to make sure that you uh, meet your record retention um, requirements. Um, as we wrap up, and we're just about out of time, um, we did have a couple of questions. So we will follow up with those um, uh, directly. And if, again, if there's some that are of interest to, to everyone, we will post those on our blog. Um, I would. Uh, call to your attention. Um, uh, there are several, and I'm going to flip through them just so you can see them. Uh, and again, they will be available when you get the email. There are a couple of uh, resources. Obviously, we've got the references listed here um, that apply to um, to uh, contract closeout matters. So, if you uh, want to do some additional reading, um, we've also referenced a number of forms that come into play. Um, as it relates to uh, things that are required in the closeout process. This is, and I, I know you probably can't see this, but at least you can uh, Google the, the form number, the 1597 is a contract closeout checklist. Um, uh, this is just a copy of the 1034 and another um, uh, sample uh, contract closeout list. So again, those are just uh, information for you um, to use um, as you start your journey of looking at your backlog of contracts to be closed out. Um, I know we covered a lot of ground. Hopefully this information was of use to you as you start uh, thinking about and planning um, uh, your contract closeout. If you have any questions, um, we work with lots of companies on contract closeouts, um, particularly in situations where companies have had turnover, have not done this before, uh, when there's acquisition, so there's uh, sometimes a lack of information or knowledge um, within the organization. Um, we, uh, you know, work with a number of companies on on helping to put together a process for how to uh, how to get caught up on the, the contract closeout uh, backlog. Um, so with that, we will end our presentation. I thank you all for listening and. Uh, if you have any questions or you have any suggestions for future webinars, um, please let us know. Thank you.